What is up guys, Blue Spooky here with another daily video. I've been a little under the weather lately and I've been seeing people saying that we've been getting a lot of repeat stories on the newest videos. So I'm going to slightly cut down the length of those videos. The longer ones will be about an hour and 30 minutes instead of two hours. That way there won't be so many stories I need to verify in them and I'll have more time to go through them to make sure that they're not read before. I also want to remind you guys that I've read tens of thousands of these stories over the years, so there will be occasionally ones that you've maybe heard before here or somewhere else. Either I just forget sometimes, or I didn't track them down when I read them those years ago or something like that, sometimes things will slip through the cracks. But I do do my best to make sure that I at least don't remember reading the stories before. Uh, if you guys are enjoying these videos, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. It really helps the videos and the channel to do well and ensures I can keep making these videos for you guys for a long time to come. Without further ado though, I will let you get right into the true scary stories and I hope you guys will enjoy them and the rest of your day. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again at the end of the video. One of my favorite hobbies is going out and exploring old abandoned buildings. Of course, that sort of thing just breeds scary stories. I used to explore in more urban areas, but they're not nearly as fascinating as old rural buildings. I belong to several groups that like to explore these sorts of old areas. Members would often suggest to others the locations of cool abandoned buildings, so they can be further explored and experienced. The strangest thing I ever explored was not actually a building though. This occurred in a rural area in Maine. The area is actually very good for exploring, as there are tons of abandoned barns and all sorts of old buildings out there. I was looking for one of these old barns when I lost track of where I was. I'm not sure how much you know about Maine, but it has a very large amount of forested area. It's definitely not the kind of place you want to get lost in. I'd also never really gotten lost like this before, at least not as significantly as I was that day. As I wandered around the woods, I thought my main goal should be trying to locate this particular barn. I knew the way to get there, so arguably if I found it, I should be able to deduce my way back out of the woods from there. I didn't find it as I was wandering though. I found something even stranger. I found what appeared to be a set of random old cellar doors. There was no building or even an old foundation around, as far as I could tell. It was just a random pair of cellar doors set in the ground. I began thinking that maybe me getting lost was a good thing. When I did get out of here, I would have a good story to tell all the others. I could see right away there were no locks on the doors. For some reason, they were a bit hard to get open though. When I finally did, I was surprised they didn't fall apart altogether. The steps led down into a really dark and dank area that I couldn't see in at all. I took out my flashlight and slowly entered this cellar. Walking down those stairs was quite a freaky experience. They creaked and bent under every step from my weight. I had no idea where they were leading, other than to an underground area. The cellar was quite interesting. I can't even really begin to describe it. It had an earthen floor, wooden support beams, and shelves made up the majority of the walls. Surprisingly, there was even an old bed laid up against one of them. There was also a table that was cluttered with various objects. Walking over to the table, I soon got the shock of my life. There were two things laying on top I would have never expected. One thing was the decayed remains of what was clearly a human hand. That was freaky enough, but the far scarier thing was a newspaper. A newspaper that was dated from only three days ago. That meant that not only was someone keeping a decaying human hand around, but they had recently been in that cellar. 
shocked, I immediately went back to the stairs and tried to make my way out of that area. I almost expected one of the weak stairs to break under my weight as I hurried back up the steps. I got to the top and looked all around to see if anyone was watching. I quietly closed the door and hurried back into the woods as quickly as I could. The walk back was very nerve-wracking. I know it's cliché to tell you this, but I thought every sound I heard was the inhabitant of that cellar coming back. I had no idea if they were directly responsible for whatever events led to someone losing their hand, but I certainly didn't want to stick around to find out. It took me two hours to find my way back to my vehicle. It was completely dark by the time I got there. I was so on edge that I had to check the back seat of my car for intruders. I even looked under my car. That's how unnerved I was. That was the last time I ever went exploring in that area. My parents bought an old house when I was 10 years old. My dad had gotten a really good job and wanted to buy a bigger place for us to move into. The house was quite huge. It was old as well, but kept in a really good condition. It was so big that all of us kids even got our own room. We had a huge attic to keep all of our storage. In this house was also a very large and dark basement. It was completely empty, though. The really interesting thing about the basement, though, was a small door located on one of the walls. It was locked when we moved in, and my dad had never been given a key for it. We had no way to open it. That little door became something of a fascination for me, my brothers, and my sisters. My dad tried to tell us, don't let your imaginations run wild now. He said it was likely just a small room that had tools in it, or maybe it had nothing at all. Yeah, telling us not to let our imaginations run wild, that pretty much just ensured that was the very thing that was going to happen. Growing up, we all used to tell all sorts of stories about what could possibly be behind this mystery door. My brother said it was a room that children would hide in when their parents were angry and fighting, like some sort of child panic room. The others all had their own ideas about what it could have been, but I don't want to bore you with all that. From age 10 to 16, I would have never considered trying to break down the door or trying to pick the lock or anything. I wasn't scared of my dad, but I knew that if I broke into it after he repeatedly insisted we don't, he would be pretty angry with me and I'd get in a lot of trouble. It was when I was 17 and I was home alone that I finally found out what was in that room. My family was all out of town and I had a few friends over. After a lot of horsing around, my buddy began talking about the door. We all got really curious and he kept insisting I try and get it open. I refused at first, telling him my dad would get very angry with me. When that didn't work, I told him the door was much more interesting when we didn't know what was really in there. That didn't work either. None of my excuses seemed to phase my friends, and I had to admit, I really wanted to know what was on the other side. We all snatched up some tools and decided to go open it up ourselves. I won't go into too much detail explaining how we did it, although it did take quite a long time to get through. Finally, though, we did get to the other side, where I saw the weirdest thing I had ever seen in my life. It was an extremely small room. I mean, I would have been too big at that age to even fit into myself. There was no lighting, so I had to use a flashlight to see around. There were what seemed to be words scrawled all over the walls. They were smeared with either blood or red paint. I told myself it was red paint. However, the decaying corpses of several birds and small animals were laying in a disgusting pile in the corner of this small room. That indicated that maybe these red smears on the wall could be bird blood. The weirdest thing, though, was there was a small child-sized rocking chair facing the far wall of the tiny room. There appeared to be a doll on the chair, turning the chair around. I saw the doll was covered with what I assumed to be bird glare. 
Its eyes had been ripped out of their sockets, and they had been filled with blood that had long since dried. It had scratches on its face, and rips in its clothes. It was missing both of its legs, below where the knees should have been. It was a freaky thing and pretty damn weird to just stumble upon. I didn't take anything out of the room. I closed and relocked the door because I didn't want my dad to get angry at me for opening it. That discovery created so many questions though that to this day I have no answers to. The weirdest thing of all was it made me more uncomfortable than I had been previously when I had no idea what was behind that door. I remember growing up in the 1980s and having things so different than they are right now. My family didn't even have air conditioning back then. It seems so basic nowadays. There also wasn't as much to do inside. There wasn't a proliferation of video games or movies or TV shows. I think about five people in the entire world had the internet back then. Summer vacations were often very dull because of this, and always pretty hot and sweaty too. When I was 13 years old, I began hanging out with a guy named Jack. He was a bit more daring than I ever was. One night, we were deep into summer break and watching some movies on our new fangled uh, VCR or whatever it was called, as well as completely sweating our butts off. On this hot summer night, Jack had a sudden idea. He thought the two of us could go down to the local swimming pool, hop over the gate, and cool off inside. While I didn't really enjoy the idea of trespassing, it wasn't too difficult for him to convince me. It was about midnight when we finally arrived at the pool. It was completely dark out, and the fence surrounding the pool was decently high. It wasn't anything a couple of teenage boys would have a problem figuring out, though. Jack and I quickly scaled the fence and set ourselves down in the pool area. Our local pool had a tendency to get very busy during the day, so having it all to ourselves was quite a surreal experience. We were already in our swimsuits, so we quickly jumped into the water. It felt so much better than I can even begin to explain. Jack and I had a lot of fun at the pool. We did cannonballs, blasted a lot of water around, and just had a great time. After a while, I dared Jack to do something that neither of us had ever had the courage to do. I dared him to jump off the highest diving board. I could kind of tell he didn't really want to, but as I mentioned, Jack was more of the adventurous type than me. He eventually gave in with pressure and I stayed at the opposite end of the pool. My back was to the pool building, where the showers were, and the entrance to the pool as well. Jack slowly climbed up to the top of the ladder. He was watching his feet the entire time, not really looking in my direction. I could tell he was scared going up there, but he was trying his best not to let on. Once he got to the top, he slowly began walking out on the board again. His eyes were constantly on his feet, and he wasn't really paying attention to me at all. It wasn't until I yelled at him, daring him to just do it, that he finally looked up from his feet and over at me. It was hard telling from such a distance, but Jack suddenly looked very alarmed and almost downright scared. He made a motion towards me, but then slipped on the board and fell into the water. Fortunately, he fell forward and didn't hit any part of his body on the pool's edge. He did hit the water pretty hard though. I immediately began swimming for my friend. He didn't resurface very quickly, but fortunately for him, I was the best swimmer I knew. I dived down and found him struggling to swim back to the surface. I grabbed on and pulled him back up and out of the water, dragging him on to the cement. Jack was panicked, but that made sense because he'd just had a pretty harrowing experience. I soon learned, though, that wasn't why he was so on edge. He jumped up to his feet, went to grab his shoes and shirt, and told me to get mine as well. I hesitated, not exactly sure what had Jack so excitable. He yelled at me to do what he told me right now. I did so quickly. 
We went to the fence, and I cut myself on a barb this time as we jumped over. Jack jumped from the top of the fence down to the ground. He twisted his ankle slightly, but that didn't stop him from running. When we finally got back to my place, Jack finally told him what caused him to fall and be so alarmed when he looked at me. He'd seen a man approaching me silently from behind, holding what looked like a small hatchet. The man had emerged from the showers and was only a few steps away from me raising his hatchet to attack when Jack had fallen in. That caused me to immediately swim away from the man. When I pulled him out, the man was not there anymore. He thought he saw the man hiding in the shadows of the room though, waiting for us to go through it. Regardless, he wanted to get over that gate and out of that place immediately. Normally, I might not have believed him. It seemed like such an outlandish story. I mean, why would this random guy with a hatchet be in the locker room of the local swimming pool at that time? But even 30 years later, he maintained it was absolutely true. And the reason I believe him is that my buddy is not the type to get scared of much of anything. Decades later though, this story still freaks him out the very same as that night, so I'm pretty sure he's telling the truth. I bought my first home about 10 years ago. It was a townhouse with three stories and a basement. I also had a tiny fenced-in backyard. I wasn't really great at meeting new people, so I really didn't know how to go about introducing myself to the neighbors. I didn't really have to make the first introduction though. I was in the backyard getting ready to give the very small lawn a mowing when I heard someone behind me call out to me. After a brief startle, I turned around and noticed a man, maybe in his mid-sixties, standing in the backyard of the adjacent house. We made pleasant introductions and the usual neighborly small talk. I told him where I was from and what I did for a living. He told me how long he'd been living in the house he owned and what the neighborhood was like. It was a very friendly talk. However, strangely enough, he asked me, Did you hear about what happened in your basement? I had no idea what he meant by that. I told him the basement was completely fine, but he insisted and asked if I had heard what happened in it. I told him no and asked for him to elaborate. Instead, he shook his head and told me it would be a good idea to talk to my realtor for the whole story. Apparently, they're required by law to tell me those sorts of things. He didn't want to get into it himself. It looked like it was something unpleasant he didn't want to talk about. It was quite a weird experience, but I tried not to think too much about it. Even if something had happened in my basement, that was all in the past. I wasn't too worried about it, and thus I did not call my realtor, nor did I ever talk to my neighbor about it again. He didn't bring it up again either in the couple of months after I'd moved in. An odd experience took place one night, though, when I had some family over to see the house. We had a small barbecue in the backyard. The neighbor that had told me about the basement initially, his name was Mike. He was over as well hanging out with me. He did not bring up the basement at all once again. I guess he felt that whatever had happened was just between me and the people who sold me the house. After everyone had left after having stayed up late drinking beer together and talking, I was still in the backyard cleaning everything up. It was dark outside, but I had a nice patio light that kept the place looking really good. I was cleaning up the grill facing the house, when suddenly something caught my eye. I quickly glanced over at the basement door, where I very distinctly saw the face of a young lady pressed up against the window of the basement. This person was clearly watching me as well. I was so startled I literally fell backwards on my butt. Despite that, I looked back at the door and distinctly saw this lady watching me and following me with her eyes. After a few moments though, the person turned away from me and appeared to walk down the basement stairs on the other side of the door. I didn't have my cell phone on me. The basement wasn't accessible from the house either, so I didn't have to worry about someone sneaking into my home or something. I ran up the stairs to my back door, got on the phone and called the police about the incident. I kept an eye out the back window to see if the lady had at any point tried to leave. 
I didn't see her doing that, though. The police soon arrived, and I gave them the basement key. They went down there and found nothing out of the ordinary. One of the officers even copped a bit of an attitude with me, thinking I knew the history of the house and that I was playing a prank on them. I had no idea what they were talking about. It was then explained to me that 20 years ago, the house was empty. A woman in the neighborhood had been kidnapped while out on a jog and kept in the basement. When someone finally broke in, she was unfortunately found dead down there. I was unaware of any of this, however. Many people in the town knew about it, so they may have just been playing a prank on me. I don't know, but I never saw anyone in the basement ever again. I doubt many people even actually remember this place existed, but before the days of Barnes & Noble, the biggest bookstore chain in the country was Crown Books. They discounted every book they sold, and that was the reason why they were able to become so big for so long. The company, however, closed down in 2001. I used to be the manager of such a Crown Bookstore. It was really the best job I ever had. Sure, it didn't pay the best, but the work itself was very satisfying and fun. I honestly looked forward to going into work every single day. I worked with some really smart students, too. It was a huge change from the previous fast food jobs I'd been employed in. Anyway, when the store was in its final throes, there wasn't a lot of money to go around. Because of this, every manager worked the shift by themselves. I took a lot of the closing shifts because I was a night owl already. I almost always let all the employees go home early, so I would be by myself in the store for about an hour or so, finishing up the last bits of work. These days, it seems bookstores have shelves that people can see over. The Crown Bookstore I worked in, though, was not like this. The shelves were all extremely high, and you couldn't even tell if there was anyone in the store with you. On the night this happened, I had one of my employees go up and down the aisles and check the bathrooms, just to make sure there was no customers left in the store. When he confirmed there was no one else inside, I let the employee out the door, then made sure the lobby lights were all off. I went into the back room to do the final paperwork for the day. Although I liked being in the store by myself, I had to admit it could be a bit frightening at times. The back room had one of those combination locks on it, though, so no matter what, I would always be fine back there at least. I was doing my paperwork when I suddenly realized there was a book that had been special ordered that had been shelved recently. I went out in the store in order to look for it and retrieve it. There were a few security lights on in the store, but they didn't provide much light at all. I didn't turn on any of the other lights either. They weren't supposed to be on after the store was closed. The book was a diet book, I guess, so I went over to the self-help section, which is where books like that were normally kept. I walked down the first aisle and turned the corner, checking through all the books to find the one I needed. I noticed it wasn't on the shelf where it was supposed to be, though. I turned the other corner and then checked on that side to see if the book was misplaced by a shelf or two or something. I did end up finding it hidden away eventually. I then walked up to the front of the store, and I could not convey how creepy this was walking through the store at night. I don't believe in ghosts myself, but I've often thought that if a ghost were to exist, a bookstore at night would be the perfect atmosphere for him or her to hang out in. Walking around in this dark store with limited view, every little shadow freaked me out. Every little noise got my attention. Walking around the gigantic stacks of books, I was happy when I arrived at the front registers. We were supposed to keep all special orders right there. So I pulled out a slip and began writing the order up. I'm not sure why I did it, but I suddenly raised my head up in that moment to look over at the security monitor. There were four cameras in the store. My blood nearly froze in my veins when I saw someone was hiding in the self-help aisle, the one I had just walked out of. 
there was a gigantic figure, maybe over six foot tall, dressed in all black, and clearly holding some sort of weapon in their hand. I wasn't sure what to do. I should have just left the store and called the police right away. I didn't want to do it in the store though. If the guy heard me, he would come after me right away. I considered doing it instead in the back room in the combination door. I would be safe there. The self-help section was on the complete opposite side of the store too, so I could probably get to the back room before he even realized what I was doing. After standing there for a moment, I leapt over the counter and began booking it for the back room. It was down a short hallway. I got to the door with no problem. I typed in the four-digit code and turned the handle. Just as I did so, I caught rapid movement out of the corner of my eye. I saw the man running at the end of the short hallway. I swung the door open and ran in, forcing it closed behind me. I immediately saw the handle begin wiggling violently. The man was clearly trying to get in. When he realized he couldn't, he tried to type in the code a few times. Then he started pounding loudly on the door. I wasn't worried about the guy getting through. It was made to keep people out after all. I called the police and they immediately sent a car over. When they arrived, the guy was still there and was just deciding to leave the store through the front door. He must have unlocked it himself. They arrested him immediately. Turns out the item he was carrying was a very sharp knife. It took me a long time to be okay working alone again. I used to work in a Borders bookstore. I was an assistant manager. One of my favorite people working at the store was a lady in charge of the children's section. She was a pleasant lady and actually was very popular with everyone working there. The kids liked her a lot too. She did story time every week and many kids came in to watch this woman with her amazingly friendly personality. One thing about the story time that no one really liked, though, were the costumes. We were sent costumes for certain stories, and were supposed to occasionally incorporate them into story time. No one really liked to wear them, though, because they always seemed really dirty. We never had any real idea how old they were, or where they had been before. We didn't know how many people might have worn them, either. Finding anyone to play with them was never that easy because of this. The costumes would always be shipped in these huge boxes, and as manager, I was one of the people who had to sign for them when they arrived. On the day this weird stuff happened, I had heard the back buzzer. Upon going back there, I noticed the gigantic box and brought it inside. Curiously, I opened it up. It was a really ugly and scary looking thing some sort of humanoid character with a gigantic head. I wish I could recall what children's book the character was supposed to be from, but I can't bring it out of my memory. There was another thing that was creepy about it though, and although most workers didn't want to wear the costumes to begin with, they especially didn't want to be anywhere near this one. Even the people who could usually be convinced were adamant this was not one they were willing to put on. When no one else would agree to do it, to keep the story time happening, the story lady decided she would wear the costume instead. That was, if I was willing to read the story to the children. It wasn't something I had ever done before, but I was definitely willing to try. About an hour before story time, the story lady went into the back room to put the costume on. I went and grabbed a copy of the book, at the story time, when the children had all gathered around, the story lady still hadn't showed up yet. When she finally did, she was very odd as well. She was kind of stumbling around a lot. I assumed it was just her acting like the character, whom I wasn't very familiar with to begin with. I began reading the book soon after. The person playing the character was supposed to have the kids sit on their lap and play with them but the old lady didn't sit down. Instead, she seemed to be waving to the kids with shaking hands. After a few moments, she almost fell over onto one of them. 
I was so confused, but thought maybe she had just lost her balance in the costume. I had this horrible thought cross my mind that maybe it wasn't really her inside or something. Maybe someone might have done something to her in the dressing room, but that didn't really make sense. There wasn't any way anyone could have gotten into our stock room. However, just as suddenly, she fell down onto her knees. I was concerned and approached her, and that was when I noticed the sound of her vomiting inside the suit. The kids were all getting freaked out now, and moved away. I helped her to get the costume hat off. The lady looked terrible. She was sweating, and was a strange shade of red. I thought perhaps she had been suffocating inside. I tried to help her to the back room, while calling another manager over to try and take care of the children in the meanwhile. I managed to get her into the stock room. I moved her over to a chair. We just happened to be beside the box the costume came in. She was looking more awful by the second. I called an ambulance immediately. Upon further examining the costume out of getting her out of it, and the box it came in, I found the tip of a razor. It had been stuck inside the costume, and apparently it had been laced with poison. The lady recalled feeling a sharp pain when putting the costume on initially, but thought maybe it was just a broken zipper or something inside. She didn't think it was anything to worry about. We had to get the police involved obviously at that point. We knew some sick individual had put that razor in there. However, there wasn't enough information to find out who. The story lady thankfully recovered just fine, but we never got another person in the store to agree to wear a costume ever again. I live in a large city. There's a homeless woman who I used to see at one of my express to local subway transfers on the way home. There always seemed to be something off about her. She wore a towel on her head usually, like how people with long hair would after they took a shower. Also, it definitely wasn't a religious head covering of any kind. It was clearly just a towel, as if the woman had just walked out freshly wet and strolled down to the subway platform. She would run all around the station, asking for money, repeating help me, help me in a really high-pitched voice in an unrecognizable accent. Late one night, I was switching from the express train to the local and got on the subway when I noticed this woman had followed me in. I walked to the end of the car and started to read my book. She came up and began asking me for money like usual. Only, I actually didn't have any on me this time. No cash, no change, only a debit card. It's at this time I realized we were the only two people in this subway car, and the doors connecting the cars wouldn't open. Okay. I figured I'd just get out at the next stop if she became too aggressive. No problem. She came up to me and started asking for money in her high-pitched cartoonish voice again. I told her that I had nothing to give her, and I was really sorry. I began nervously waiting for the subway to reach the next stop as she started pacing around. Only, this train was now running express until the end of the line. Six stops worth. She didn't seem to realize this, though, and walked over to punch the subway doors, screaming at the top of her lungs. All of a sudden, she turned back toward me. There was no accent or high-pitched voice this time. She looked me dead in the eyes and just started screaming, DIE! in a really angry and deep voice. She began trying to attack me, and for the entire seven minutes it took for the train to reach the station, I had to hold her off the entire time. After it stopped, I immediately took off running while she stayed behind in the car. She used to be a permanent fixture at that stop, but ever since that incident, I've never seen her since. In 2003, I was working as a stripper in the Phoenix area. I had been dancing for almost a year and was still getting the hang of how to get the most money from a regular with the least amount of clinginess reciprocated. I was working on and off at four different places. 
Club 1, 2, 3, and 4 for reference, alternating day shifts and night shifts, depending on money. One night shift, this skinny, scraggly-looking guy comes in and hones in on me right away. From the way he was bouncing and twitching in his seat, even in the lighting of the club, it was clear he was a meth addict, and he must have been higher than my heels were. No biggie, I was raised by meth addicts after all, so as long as he was happy, should be some easy money. We go to VIP, chat, I relieve him of his paycheck, and he goes on his way. Next night, he's back again, and looking for me specifically. I get his name, Steve, and tell him my name, Tori, my fake backstory, and head back again. He told me he was a truck driver, and only in town a few days a month. We have a perfectly nice, if not jittery, time. No red flags, really. Everyone goes home fairly happy. Repeat the next night, and then I don't see him again for a month. This whole routine continued for about four months. Eventually, he started bringing in the finest gas station meth addict approved gifts when he came in to see me. By this point, he was also serenading me half the time instead of having me dance for him. His favorite was Picture by Kid Rock and Cheryl Crow. Thankfully, I spent a lot of time with my back to him, so I could only hear snippets of his impassioned baritone. The singing was creepy, not just because it was always on repeat. He would always change the lyrics to be specific to me. The longer he sang, the more grabby he would get as well. Not anywhere illegal, mind you, but like grabbing my face and forcing me to stare at him. Pressing my hand to his heart, trying to press his hand to mine. By the end of this month's visit, he asked me to move in with him. He told me he just wanted to have me at his house all the time. He must have envisioned himself as the typical customer in shining armor, telling me he wants to save me and take me away from all this. I decided to be a little more honest with him and explained to him I was already in a relationship and not interested in men either. Particularly, I was not interested in him. He then told me he'd let me keep my girlfriend. All he'd need to do was keep me three days a month when he was in town. Obviously, I shut him down immediately. He started begging me to think about it, and that he'd hear my final decision when he got back next month. After that, I asked the manager to ban him. Unfortunately, without a pick of him on hand at all times, that was pretty much impossible. I settled for alerting the security, bartender, and manager to give me a warning if they saw him around asking for me again. When his time of the month came around again, I switched to a different shift at other clubs to avoid him. When I went back to Club One the next week after he was supposed to have left, a couple of plastic grocery bags were there waiting for me. They were full of notes scrawled on crumpled, dirty scraps of paper. They also had small stuffed animals, silk roses, roses made of paint knees, mismatched taped together greeting cards and other random detritus. There was also like a 50 page barely legible letter professing his love, insisting again I move to his place right now. I was sufficiently creeped out at this point, and happy I'd managed to miss him this month. The following month rolled around, and I ditched what had become my regular club in order to avoid ever seeing him again. I was now working the day shift at Club 2 good money from lots of bored people on their lunch breaks. It was getting to the last couple of hours of my shift and was pretty slow. I was on stage, not really paying attention as I finished up my routine. Because of this, I didn't see him until I was heading downstairs to get off stage. I noticed him a few feet in front of me, waving and yelling my name over and over. There was no way to get around him either. As soon as I got to the bottom of the stairs, he grabbed me up in a big hug, obviously surprising me. I did not want him touching me, but he wouldn't let go and kept on gripping fistfuls of my hair and smelling it. I pushed away from him and started to tell him that my shift was over. That was my last stage, and I was going home now. He looked very upset. He said he just wanted to hang out with me before he had to leave town tonight. I told him he'd have to pay extra for me to sit with him 
whether I'm dancing or not. He agreed, and I went and gave the bartender and security a heads up that this guy was the creepy stalker guy I'd been talking about. Instead of having me actually dance for him, he had me straddle him while we talked. He was unusually shaky and jumpy this time, so I resorted to making him sit on his hands so he wouldn't touch me. He proceeded to tell me how he'd been searching every club in the city looking for me this month, how he'd asked various people if his girlfriend Tori was there. He told me he'd had his house all cleaned up and ready for me to move into. I reminded him again that I was not moving in with him and he excitedly replied, Well, you just don't know you want to right now. I again reminded him of my girlfriend, who I was making plans to move with. He said that our whole lives were about to change now that we'd found each other. Between all this conversation, he'd begun singing again. Despite the money, I decided he was being way too crazy this time, and I was done with everything. I really needed to get home. Before I could get up, though, he wrapped his arms around my waist, literally picked me up in the air, and started running with me towards the exit. I was screaming, trying to flag down the bartender, DJ, or anyone, because security wasn't there all of a sudden. He'd made it out to the hallway, only about ten feet from the door, when the massive security guard stepped back inside from walking a girl to her car. He tried to dart around the guard still carrying me. I reached for security, while Steve tried to pull me away and out the door. Thankfully, the brick wall of a security guard managed to plant himself in front of us and pulled me out of Steve's arms before he could try anything else. He insisted he was just joking, and he was only trying to tell me goodbye. I bolted out of there and into the dressing room, though, while he was still screaming for me to come say goodbye to him. The security guard practically carried him one-handed outside. Thankfully, he was banned for good this time. I decided to take a vacation with my girlfriend for a couple months after, just in case he tried to follow me again and stuff me into his trunk or something. He continued to call all the clubs looking for me while I was gone. They all lied and said I quit working there, and I didn't see him again after. There was this old hiking trail way out in the woods off a ridge that my aunt and uncle lived on. It wasn't even like an official trail or anything like that. It's just that ever since anyone could remember, there was always a walkway through the woods that grass never grew over for whatever reason. We live in one of the most rural areas in the country, so we were always careful not to travel too far, out of fear of getting lost of course. I bring that up because I'm not sure why we hadn't realized before that we always just stayed on the trail. If we just followed along it, it would be pretty impossible for us to get lost at all. When I brought that up to my cousin, it was like he had this monumental facepalm realization moment. We made a plan to take a few days and try and see just how far this old trail actually went. Maybe map out the area a bit. We grabbed some supplies to hold us over because we expected to camp out for at least one night. If it didn't take us more than one night, we'd probably just camp out anyway. We set out pretty early in the morning. My cousin Jim and I were the ones going along. As I mentioned, it was a long trail. We had been decently far out on it. I think it was probably around 4 or 5 o'clock when we passed the furthest point we'd ever been before. The trail just kind of went on and on, and by the time it was dark, we knew we'd have to set up camp for at least one night. We put up our tent, and it was really pretty fun. Our sense of adventure was really peaked now. We stayed up late at night talking, and wondering what we would come across the next day. When we woke up the next morning, my cousin told me he hadn't slept very great the night before. I asked him why and he told me he thought he'd heard someone walking around our campsite. I reminded him that we were way out in the woods, and there were lots of animals around anyway. Best not to let his imagination run away. With this said, he seemed to relax a bit. As we got up for the day, at around noon or so, we noticed something really strange up ahead of us, yet off the trail a slight ways. As we got closer, 
we realized it was one of those small silver Airstream trailers. It was really old, and we assumed it was abandoned. We went up to it. I wanted to take a closer look and maybe go inside. Jim didn't want to have anything to do with this. He kept telling me that I didn't live in the country and didn't know there were still people who lived way out in the hills like this. I didn't care though. I was positive it was abandoned. I told him I would knock on the door first at least. I knocked on the door and waited. No answer. I knocked again and again. Still no answer. I grabbed for the door latch with Jim protesting the entire time. I pulled up the latch and was immediately hit with a nasty smell. I stepped up into the extremely hot trailer. It was a tiny one-room affair. Against one wall was a makeshift kitchen and a counter. The near wall had a bench on it where there was a tiny bed. At the far end was a tiny door. I guess that must be to a toilet or something. There were filthy clothes everywhere. There were nasty dishes in the sink and the counter as well. I didn't figure the smell was coming from the clothes or the dishes, though. I thought it was coming from the toilet area. I guess that made sense why that would smell. I knew I shouldn't open the door, but my curiosity drew me towards it. I slowly approached it with my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't expect to find anything, but the unknown is so frightening. I heard a noise behind me and turned to see Jim step into the trailer. He was put off by the smell as well, but admitted his curiosity had gotten the better of him. I turned back to the door and slowly pulled the latch. Yeah, there was a small toilet inside, but that wasn't what was causing the smell. Instead, there was a decaying corpse in the bathroom. I almost felt like vomiting. I slammed the door shut, leaning against the wall for a moment. I heard Jim frantically calling my name around me. I turned around and saw him holding his Swiss army knife. That's my knife, Jim said. I asked him where he'd found it. It was laying on the counter apparently. He showed it to me and showed me the engraving on it as well, so we knew this had to be his. We put two and two together and realized somebody must have stolen it from his pack last night. Whoever that person was had brought it back to this trailer. And whoever lived in this trailer apparently lived with a corpse in his bathroom. We hurried and got out of there as quick as possible. We hustled. We didn't set up camp that night. Instead, we kept going the entire way. We were half dead when we got back to the house the following morning. But after that experience, we knew there was no way we would have gotten any sleep anyway. When I was about 13, my family moved to a different state. We were one of those families that moved around a lot. We didn't even stay at this place very long, a year at the most. I really liked this house, though. There was a brick ranch on top of the hill. The yard itself was huge, maybe a whole acre or so. It had an old shed, an old doghouse, and some fruit trees as well as a garden, and we really liked it. The yard was fenced in with barbed wire, and there were miles and miles of forest surrounding it. I'll admit right off the bat that I'm more of an indoors sort of guy. But we didn't have cable, and this was before the days of internet. TV reception was very poor as well, so I took to exploring the woods surrounding the area. I used to find all sorts of things, depending on which direction I went in. There were old abandoned barns, other structures huge fields even. It was all depending on how far I was willing to hike. Several times I would gotten shocked by electric fences. I had to wonder why they were so far out in the woods like that. A couple of months out from arriving there, I was out exploring when I came across an old trail. It was a little bit but not completely overgrown, so I decided to follow along it and see what I came across. After a short time, I noticed I was coming upon a clearing. As I got closer to it, I was a bit startled to notice it seemed to be a small cemetery of some sort. It was overgrown with moss, vines, grass, and leaves, but it was definitely a cemetery. And there were about 20 grave markers. None of them were neat gravestones like you'd see in a regular graveyard. 
Instead, there were stick crosses and stones with what looked like writing on them. I guess this is the sort of thing I should have found frightening, but I've always liked scary stuff. I was very fascinated by what I'd found. A few of the rocks had writing on them, but they were quite difficult to read. The first few words were always blurry, but eventually I was able to make out a name on one of them. A net something. I thought it must have been like a cat name or something. The graves were far too small to be for people. I figured I had stumbled upon a pet cemetery. When I got to the third stone I could read though, my heart froze in my chest. It was the first one that I could make out all the words. Right then I realized what this cemetery actually was. It read, Future Grave of Kimberly, Killed in Her Sleep. I was able to read a couple more of them. On each one of them, it seemed to be a future grave of someone and listed the way that they would be killed. It was the strangest thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. Of course, I was freaked out, but I didn't want to leave right away either. I read a few more, then decided to get the hell out of there. It was a few months later on TV. It gives me chills to this very day. A man whose name I will not give out was denied parole. He had been arrested for the murders of two women. Their names were Kimberly and Antoinette. I immediately remembered that graveyard. I wondered if this was the same guy who'd made that graveyard. I wondered if he hadn't been caught. How many more people had he been planning on killing? There were about 20 graves there already, and who knows if he would have ever stopped if he arrived at that number. I've only had one really scary thing ever happen to me, but it sure was a doozy. It happened when I was doing some off-trail hiking. One of my hobbies is exploring abandoned buildings, abandoned mines, and things like that. There was an old abandoned mine I had heard about. I had been wanting to check it out for a while. I delayed it though because it was going to be quite the long hike to get there. I finally got some time to do so and decided to go and check it out. It was a late 19th century mine, so I had always been worried about it collapsing or something. Mostly, I was worried it would be difficult to find. I was able to get a map from another explorer online, though, who said he had already been there. There was a trail I had to follow for quite a while, but the quickest way to get to my destination was to go off that trail. In fact, the map I had received told me to go off at a certain point. I was pretty fortunate not to get lost. At one point though, I heard some noises and saw some movement off in the distance as well. I got quiet, hoping to see a deer or something. However, what I saw instead was a man who was walking towards the trail. He was a pretty big man too, like a biker, wearing denim with multiple patches on it. He had to be about six foot six. I don't even want to take a guess on his weight. Normally, when hiking, if I see another hiker, I'll make contact with them to be friendly. But there was something about this guy that really freaked me out. He seemed to be very out of place here. Instead, I crouched down and waited until he was already gone. I went on my way, and it was probably a good two more hours before I made it to the mine. I was very excited. Outside the mine entrance, there was a crumbling old building. It was gray and made of rotted wood. I was very curious about it, but I decided to check out the mine before I did that. The mine itself was pretty fascinating, but only if you're really into that sort of thing. I spent some time exploring it, then set off to go back. On the way out, I remembered I had wanted to check out that building outside. I was a bit concerned too, because it looked like it could crumble apart at any moment. If I decided it was too unstable, I could just take a simple look inside, then leave immediately. I opened the door and almost immediately fell over in shock. There was a teenage girl in the shack. She was cuffed to an old stove and gagged as well. I was way too freaked out at first to know what to do, but then I realized I had to go ungag her immediately. She started panicking, telling me she'd been abducted nearly a week ago. It had happened as she was leaving a biker bar. 
Honestly, I didn't stop to think that it was weird a teenager would be in a biker bar to begin with. Anyhow, the guy knocked her out and brought her to this old building. She begged me to help her get free, and of course I did so. I searched through my belongings and found something to pick her handcuffs. They were single lock cuffs, so I was able to free her after some considerable effort. Of course she was still panicked and did her best to run out of the building right away. I was able to calm her down a bit, enough to ask her when the guy who kidnapped her was last there. She said it had been about five hours earlier. She then described the man to me, and I realized it was that same big guy I'd seen earlier. I told her he seemed to be sticking to the trail, and I knew a different way to get out of the area off trail. I knew she had gone through a horrible experience, and was terrified that she would have to be as quiet as possible. She told me she understood, but as we left I had to keep slowing her down, telling her it was essential we remain as quiet as possible. I kept worrying that when we got back to the place where I went off trail, we would run into the guy right there. I kept a firm lookout for the man, hoping to see him passing us towards the mine, so we knew we'd have more time to get away. I didn't see him anywhere at all though. We were moving for about an hour, before we got back to my car. When we did, there was already a pickup truck parked right next to it. The lady, whose name I won't reveal, told me it was that man's truck. I had to assume the guy was either around, or he'd gone back to the shack and we'd just missed him. I hurried her into my car, and drove her right to the police station. The biker guy was arrested soon after. It turns out he'd grabbed her in order to blackmail her dad to get some money from him. I don't know how that all turned out in the end, but I do know the guy went to jail, and the girl returned home safely in the end. I heard it one night, and it quite startled me. I was laying in bed just reading a book. I began drifting off slightly when I started to hear a strange knocking on the floor. Needless to say, I was a bit surprised. I tried to calm myself down a bit. We lived in a really old house, so it wasn't unusual to hear all sorts of noises in the night. I went back to reading my book. Just a few minutes later, though, I heard more knocking on the floor. This time, I noticed something that really scared me, though. It was a rhythmic sound. That worried me because it made me believe the knocking noise was being made by a person. I was extremely scared and was also 16 years old at the time. I was the only person in the home who had a bedroom on the bottom floor. I wasn't going to go into the basement and check it out by myself. However, I also wasn't willing to go and get my parents up either. Instead, I sort of just curled up in my bed in fear and slapped some earplugs in my ears. I read a little bit more, and until I went to bed, I convinced myself that it was all in my imagination. The following day, I told my parents I thought there might be a ghost or something in the house. They sort of made fun of me a little bit, and when I explained what I had heard, the response was immediately dismissive. They told me the noise I was hearing was likely just the house settling, and that if it bothered me so much, I should just put my earplugs in and ignore it completely. The following night, it happened again though. Again, I heard some knocking on the floor of my bedroom. And again, the knocking was rhythmic. I put my earplugs in my ears like I was told to, but that didn't really solve the problem at all. Yeah, it did cut out the noise, but just getting rid of the symptoms doesn't cure the disease. I no longer heard the knocking, but that didn't mean it wasn't there. My parents were probably right. The knocking was likely just the house settling, but it still bugged me. I didn't mention that it happened again to my parents the next day. I really wanted to, but they were both very matter-of-fact people, and I knew what their response would be right away. Instead, I kept it all to myself. The following night, I was staying up reading a book again. This time when it happened, though, I decided to go check out the basement myself. Yeah, stupid, I know. But I really had to go down there and see what was tormenting me so much. I got up and went over to the basement door. 
I stood in front of it for a few moments, then opened it. The light to our basement was at the bottom of the stairs. I began quietly walking down them, like any scared child or teenager would do. I felt really stupid as I took my time walking down the stairs. Each step I took going down, I thought about changing my mind and running back up and shutting the door. I didn't though in the end. Our house was really nice but much older, which is why the house settling argument made sense in my head. The reason I tell you about this now, however, is because as I was walking down those steps, each and every one made a really large creak. It made me nervous, thinking about whatever might be in the basement, becoming aware that someone was coming down the stairs. That would just make it so much more likely that I was going to get grabbed or something. When I got about halfway down the steps, I heard the knocking sound start up once again. It startled me, and I actually tripped over my own feet. I fell down the remaining stairs and hit with a really hard bump. Then I heard something drop, and I knew someone was definitely down in the basement. All of a sudden, something hit me in the back of the head and knocked me silly. It didn't completely knock me out, though. I heard someone running across the room. I could see their form in the meter light coming from the basement door. He flung open the door to the outside, sprinted out, and that was the last thing I remembered. My dad rushed down the steps and turned on the lights soon after. We called the cops, but nothing came of it. I never heard the knocking again, either. I guess that means the guy never came back, but I had no idea what he was doing down there in the basement for so long anyway. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.